Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. My name is Aaron Espinoza, and I have the privilege of being the executive director of the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival and the library and observatory director as well. So thank you for coming today. Uh, thank you. If I can ask everybody uh, to turn off your cell phones, please. I don't want any interruptions in Annabelle's uh, talk. <laughs> It might be, it might be. Um, all right, uh, before we get started and talk about the uh, writer series and what's ha happening, right now the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory is in week two of our Rancho Mirage, or our summer reading club. We are encouraging everyone to sign up uh, for our summer reading club. Uh, the, more, the more you read, which I'm, in, I'm guessing we have some pretty avid readers in here, um, the more you read, the more prizes you have chances to win, including a private stargazing to the Rancho Mirage Observatory for 20 of your friends. Uh, so please sign up. Uh, it is a, a sponsored event, so I'm looking to really get our numbers going there. Um, our Rancho Mirage Writer Series, uh, we've been hosting these for several times uh, throughout this uh, calendar year. Unfortunately, we did have to take the two-year break, but we have 10 more writer series events before the end of the fiscal, or before the end of the calendar year. Um, I'm not gonna go over a list of them. I hope you saw them on the screen here, uh, but our next one will be on September 23rd, um, where we will welcome librarian and author, Ashley Weaver. She will be discussing her new book, The Key to Deceit, a delightful World War II mystery. Uh, for more details, you'll go to our website, uh, www.rmwritersfest.org and you'll get a lot of information on all 10 uh, authors that are coming through. And thanks to our Writers Festival Foundation, every author that we bring in, we are also bringing in 200 books for the first 200 attendees. That could not be done without our Rancho Mirage Writers Festival Foundation Board, our executive team who you see here, uh, Debbie and Liz, uh, but uh, our founder, Jamie Kabler, I'd like to introduce. So to today's uh, lecture, or talk, uh, Annabelle is a three-time returning uh, author. She is a 2018 Rancho Mirage Writers Festival alumni an actress, activist, uh, activist, humorist, and author of five books, including the New York Times bestseller and Thun Thurber Prize finalist, I See You Made It and Made an Effort. She's written the New for The New Yorker, The New York Times, LA Times, The Wall Street, and The Wall Street Journal, among other publications. In addition to writing, Gurwitch, or Annabelle, sorry, uh, <laughs> is a longtime co-host of the cult TV uh, hit Dinner and a Movie on TBS, where a movie was aired and a recipe for a dish with a name relating to the movie was prepared live. And let me tell you, that was my first introduction to Annabelle, and I have fallen in love with her since. Um, Annabelle says that her latest uh, collection of essays are a love letter to the city of L.A., and a book for those who have reinvented themselves at least a dozen times. Please join me in welcoming Annabelle Gurowicz. Thank you. It is so fantastic to be back here and to be live in air conditioning. You know, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, Jamie Kabler has, with the Writers' Festival here, put this, and Debbie and Aaron and the library have really put Rancho Mirage on the map as an important destination for authors. And so it is just an extraordinary thing to be here with this community because you're one of the most sought communities now in the country. And... <laughs> And we don't forget that. You know, um, I wrote this book over a period of years. And like all of my books, they start out with a number of incidents that start to form into an idea for a book. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the inciting incidents, read from a couple little passages, and then let's do a Q&A, because that's the most fun part, is getting to talk to you and have a conversation. So 
I was at someone's house in Hollywood. It could have been anyone. It could have been Barbara Streisand's, but it wasn't. <laughs> but it was someone else's house in Hollywood, and I ran into an old friend, Marissa Tomei. This is a few years ago. It's like five or six years ago. And we're gossiping, as you do with people you started out in the beginning of your career in the salad days. And we were talking about how unbelievably at this age, still, we're still hustling. That everybody we know is, if they're doing a TV show, they're also doing a movie, and then you're doing social media. And Marissa said to me, oh, yes, because you, you work in show business, you get a contact Jew. It's amazing, you're just Jewish, just from a Jewish adjacent, right? She said, when does the coasting begin? I th there should be coasting. I thought I'd be coasting by now. When she said, I thought I'd, yeah, I'd be coasting by now, I said, oh my God, that is so funny. So for about four years, every year, once a year, I'd write to Marissa an email that said, I can't, have you started coasting? <laughs> when does the coasting start? And we would, she'd say, not yet. And finally, about uh, three years ago, I said, Marissa, I have come up with a book to get that one line in. Not that this book just contains one funny line, but this was the initial spark. And then the things happen that seem to have that same theme, but it really started with that one comment, because all the books that I write, they start with, you know, this overarching idea. And that was the one that started this one. But it was that one idea, and then... A number of things happen, so I'm going to set the stage for the stories of this book. This is how it started. In the weeks before my kid flew the coop, I was racing around the house like a maniac. You need to know how to boil an egg, iron a shirt, make a fire by rubbing two sticks together. Mom, I'm a vegan. I'll be living in a dorm. You don't know how to start a fire with matches. And nobody irons anymore. We don't even own an iron. Now, from what I'd read, after our tearful college dorm room goodbyes, my future would be filled with hot air balloon torns and Zumba classes. Motherhood, my work was done. <laughs> I could cry reading that line now. Oh, I think I... Hot flash broke through my hormones. Okay, kids successfully launched. With all that me time, I could improve the quality of my life, enjoy my blissfully quiet and tidy home. Maybe I'd learn to make soup from scratch. My husband and I would rekindle our waning desire for each other. Not only that, I was excitedly planning on replacing the living room sofa that we'd had since before we'd gotten married 20-some years prior. That love seat had seen a lot of action. It was the first piece of furniture we'd bought together, and it was perfect for newlywed canoodling. Then came baby puke, mac and cheese spillage, <laughs> popcorn grease, pen marks, followed by teenage hormones. <laughs> a friend of Ezra's had camped out on that couch for a week, the last hurrah before heading off to college. Echo, Ezra's friend's name, they all have such great names now, had some kind of endocrine disorder. And now I couldn't get the scent of armpits and old sneakers out of the fabric. <laughs> After my kid was safely ensconced in their college dorm room, I went furniture shopping at a neighborhood store. It's the kind of place that sells handmade chocolates and candles with ironically themed scents like neo-hippie bullshit <laughs> and non-binary anxiety. <laughs> and it carries a furniture line named for iconic Californian authors, the James Elroy, louche, low to the ground, ideal landing spot for the falling down drunk. The Bukowski, a bit hulking, large enough to accommodate a big man or a couple in flagrante. The Joan Didion, half the size, more delicately rendered, nothing frou-frou about it. I was leaning Bukowski. 
I had plans for that couch. Sure, my marriage had been so strained that we'd been sleeping in separate bedrooms for upwards of a year, but in the 1950s, couples spent entire marriages in separate bedrooms. The state of our union wasn't perfect. I assumed my husband and I weren't any more miserable than anyone else who made the same amount of money as we did. I was holding up a selection of swatches when my husband announced that I should pick out the fabrics I liked best. He too had plans, they just didn't include me. Instead of a new couch, he wanted a new life. Then both my parents died, my kid landed in rehab for drug and alcohol addiction, one of my cats disappeared, and my tennis teacher fired me. Yeah. Getting booted from my weekly cardio tennis class at $20 a pop seemed like a low blow. Sure, I was showing up late without sneakers, weeping continuously through the lesson, but the six other mothers and I had been playing since our kids were in middle school together, and this was my last connection to that community. And despite five years of lessons, I dubbed my serve the matzo ball because it looks like it's got substance, but it crumbles on impact. But I wore my lack of improvement as a badge of honor. I was reliably inept in a world that was constantly changing. At least I was consistent. And that was really my breaking point. You know, when you're persona non grata at the public tennis courts of Van Nuys, Yes, public tennis courts, not even a private club. This is when you know you've really hit a low point. But, you know, what ensued after that moment and what all the stories are about are these different ways in which, in this one particular moment in life, I went through things that seem like immutable changes. You know, there are times in your life where you go through reinventions. And sometimes I feel like we get put into what I call resilience prison, right? Take three, get back on your feet again. Take three resiliences and call me in the morning. But there are times in life when you hit immutable changes, like when your parents pass and you graduate from being a daughter or a son or a person, a child of your parents, and you become, as I write about in chapter one of the book, in one of the chapters in the book, about becoming a family elder. <laughs> and whether you're ready for it or not, you are suddenly in this position. Or when my formerly son, Ezra, became a non-binary person. You know, this was a change that was no going back from. I didn't have a resilience for that. I did blame myself at one point thinking, you know, maybe it was a bad idea that at, at their graduation party from high school, I shouldn't have said, we're having a party under the tree where I buried their foreskin. <laughs> that might have been part of the problem. No, that was not at all the problem. In fact, you know, one of the chapters in the book is about adapting. And this is where, again, I make the distinction between resilience and adaptability. There are times in life where we have to acquire completely new skills for living. And that's what I think the sweet spot for the stories in this book are. And, you know, the thing that's just so crazy that we've all lived through this pandemic, you know, has changed our paradigm so much. It even changed the meaning of this book cover when you think about adaptability and resilience. When I first picked this book cover out, which was right before the pandemic hit, I thought, well, nothing says downward mobility more than a couch in your yard. <laughs> then the pandemic happened and says, nothing says you're privileged <laughs> more than having an outdoor space to entertain in. So things have changed so much for me in my life. And, and this is a book that I hope will help you if things have changed in your life. Um, and all the, the, the stories are about a wide variety of things. But one of the things I really wanted to write about that I had way too good a time writing about was about 
the messages that I felt I had internalized as a younger person about what this period in my life would be. And many of those messages I got from Nancy Myers movies, like something's got to give, right? You know, and let me just say, it was so much fun to write about this because, first of all, anything I say funny about Nancy Myers is not going to hurt Nancy Myers' career. <laughs> She's a genius. Uh, but what I thought was so funny was, uh, as a person who had just gotten divorced, was wondering how I was going to keep paying my mortgage before I started taking in borders, which is a chapter in the book about how I didn't know what I was headed for when I imagined I was going to become a blousy housewife with a cigarette and slippers, taking in boarders, making coffee and oatmeal for breakfast, and what turned out to be an experience of opening my home to youth experiencing homelessness that just broke open my heart, and it's like I, I gained another heart for motherhood, a different kind of motherhood opened up. It, it changed my life so much that I still have young people passing in. Now. It's been years now. It's like everyone in Los Angeles has a key to my home now. <laughs> I, you coming to LA? Let me give you a key. Come, come live with me. Um, but, uh, you know, this, this, when I was watching, it, it was at this moment when I was uncertain about my future, when I saw Something's got to give. And there's Diane Keaton. And she's supposedly the same age I am now. And she is living the life. She's the most successful playwright on Broadway. And she has not one, but two men vying for her. She's got Jack Nicholson and Keanu Reeves. <laughs> Both of them. That happens every day to me. <laughs> what has gone wrong in my life, you know? Uh, but so it was, it was really fun for me to sort of look at these stories that I read about in books and in movies and look at the expectations versus reality. And one of those that I write about is the movie, and it was based on a book, of course, Under the Tuscan Sun. Do you remember that? Oh, it was such a hit and the bane of my existence. Diane Lane, also in a similar situation to me, right? Uh, her life falls apart, but her friend sent her on a tour of Tuscany where, guess what? She falls in love with a villa. She gets to buy it after one meeting with the, with the finance, and she doesn't even have a job, and the villa is run down, but it has good bones. Not only does it, I mean, this, not only does it have good bones of all the improbable things, not only does it have good bones, but there's a vineyard, but there's just one sad grape. But vineyards can be revived. And she's, she does this whole renovation of the house. There's handsome, hottie, McHandsome on every corner of it. Now, that really does happen, not to me, but they are really cute over there. But then, then the movie has the denouement, and I, I had to write it about this because this just was just too much fun. Yet of all the leaps of faith this film requires, there is one that I simply cannot wrap my head around. Where is the scene when she realizes the contractor has taken a shortcut and piggybacked the plumbing from the upstairs to the downstairs? Which means the water pressure will never be more than a trickle in her master bathroom. Or the blowout when she learns that the renovation will cost $20,000 more than the estimate. Or that inevitable day when the work crew simply stops showing up. <laughs> the renovation comes off without a hitch. The results are resplendent and she throws a wedding for one of her workmen. Somewhere in the world, contractors watch this film and laugh their heads off. <laughs> That's who I realized this movie was written for. Contractors, they have conventions and they just watch and they just think it's hilarious. And I also, I, I just, I it just went a little overboard in this chapter, but if you'll bear with me, I also write about Diane Lane's star. And let me just say, I love Diane Lane. <laughs> <laughs> and she started a movie 
It took place in, in uh, 1969 called A Walk on the Moon. It's actually one of my favorite films. But <laughs> in the 1999 A Walk on the Moon, set in 1969, Lane plays a woefully unappreciated Jewish housewife. Does this inspire her to pursue a meaningful career and devote herself to charitable causes? Nope. Instead, she opts for what I call the man cure and has an affair with a traveling blouse salesman who services the Catskill camp where she summers with her family. Vigo Mortensen <laughs> plays the blouse man who sells blouses from the back of his converted school bus. Vigo Mortensen? In what world do unhappy Jewish suburbanites luck into liaisons with Aragon, Ranger of the North? <laughs> After I let folks know that my husband and I were splitting, one of my neighbors, the ice cream man, <laughs> who distributes a line of ice cream to several groceries, informed me that he frequented nude beaches. And if I had some girlfriends, we could all pile into his old truck and go together. <laughs> Paunchy, hair sprouting from all the wrong places. Ranger of Nada. Uh, some of these stories in this book, you know, they're, they're the stories that actually... The, the premise, I, and, I, and you know, it's such a funny thing. I don't really quite know how this happened to me because I started out as an actress and I had one goal in life. I trained to do Shakespeare and Jacobean tragedies. And my goal was to act in off-off, nowhere near Broadway productions <laughs> where you had a pretty good chance of sleeping with the majority of the cast. That was the goal I managed to achieve. <laughs> but somehow, I wound up hosting movies on Friday night on TBS, and it was the indignity of that. It was the indignity of finding, you know, what I think of as the dissonance between expectations and reality. And that's really, I think, where comedy lives. And sometimes... You know, I think, I mean, a lot of the, the things I write are, I mean, everything that I write, of course, is constructed and I do punch up. But sometimes you just wind up in a situation that is just a premise that just can't be beat. And then, you, you know, you thank the comedy gods for that sort of thing. And there's a story, one of the stories in the book is what I consider just a great premise that I walked into. And that's a story about becoming an elder in my family. And it's a story of, it's called Spirited Away. That's that chapter where I was going up to visit my family in Northern California, and I book a flight. And I think it's something called an empty leg flight. And I've booked it on kayak, and it lets, costs less than $100. And so I'm assuming it's like a medical transport. And I'm gonna be carrying a kidney in a cooler. And I show up at this hangar and know it's an empty seat on a private plane that I've accidentally booked. And I'm like, oh my God. And the thing is, is, you know, I'm an environmentalist. I have railed against flying private until the very minute that I flew private. <laughs> and that's when I knew I had made an immutable change. I'm the kind of person who would do anything to do that again. As I write in the book, I sat down and inhaled the scent of my leather seat and the scent of people whose college loans are all paid off. And I thought, I've got to do this again. And of course, I show up in Northern California in such a, you know, hashtag milk of human kindness flowing through me because I'm so happy because I have been treated. I've been coddled like a boiled egg on the entire flight. But what I didn't know was I had booked a flight from my way home 
on Spirit Airlines. <laughs> now, that's just what I call like a, you have to make a sacrifice to the comedy gods. You just can't make that up. One day you're flying private, and the next you're flying on the Greyhound in the air. <laughs> ah, and the things you learn about yourself. Um, there is something I wanted to read if you're up for this. You know, it's been a really interesting experience. Whenever I write, I, I wonder, and I hold, well, I hold all of you in my mind when I'm writing. You know, and I think most writers do this. We sit and look off, staring off in the middle distance, hoping that our, our writing will connect with you. And what I wasn't sure about, one of the things I wasn't sure about was writing about my child uh, and how I as a parent w adapted to their changing their gender identification. And what has been so incredibly rewarding has been that that is the chapter that is most talked about at all the events I've been doing around the country live and on Zoom because it is entering a, a new world for many of us. And I mean, this trend is, 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 this is a new thing for most of us. And so many of us have primarily younger people in our, in our lives, whether it's our children, our grandchildren, nieces and nephews, students we work with, or younger people in our lives who have found this, have, a, have adopted a new gender identity, the non-binary identity. And, and it's been so fantastic to hear a conversation about this. And I, I wasn't sure how this would be received, but I felt that it was important because I felt it was so timely and so in some sense, taboo to talk about. Um, you know, there's a, a number of subjects that I, I like to tackle, and my favorite thing is when I feel like I have something new to add to a taboo subject, you know, which is why there is a chapter about when I realized the inside of my vagina had the climate of the Sahara and what I did to, to change that. But this, <laughs> which has also been a very bit popular one in women's book groups, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, but I wanted to write about this because it wasn't about my child's experience, but the experience of a parent and an experience that I felt like was a journey of love and acceptance that was something timely. And so I want to read a little bit of that, if you'll go with me on that, of just how hard it, it's hard to be a parent these days. Um, I think, you know, there's also, we're, our, our generation, our, our, young, our young people, they've just had such a hard time during the pandemic and just living through this moment. So I'm hoping that um, some of this will, will resonate. And, and I did some research, and I don't usually read this, but I, don't, I hope you won't miss this part of the book. And if you'll, if you'll bear with me, I don't know how funny it is to talk about the um, adolescence of crustaceans. I thought it was a laugh riot. <laughs> but I included this little bit of info, and I, I'd love to read this little bit, and then let's start talking. So I'm talking about just being a parent of a gen, being, being a Gen X parent of a Gen, gen Z person. Gen, gen Zs and Y, Gen, I'm not sure what they are anymore. And they don't know either. In middle and high school, Ezra had played the upright bass. I never tire of hearing renditions of Fly Me to the Moon or a Bach cantata. But since then, they'd moved on to experimental electronic compositions, all of which I titled, My Migraine. <laughs> the tracks, Ezra explains, are a mashup of ambient, trance, nightcore, dubstep, deconstructed club, drone, and distorted lo-fi psychedelia. What does that sound like? Darth Vader played at half speed, Alvin and the Chipmunks played at warp speed, whale callings, and the cries of a million babies whose diapers need changing. <laughs> but the last thing I want to do 
is appear less than supportive. So I summon ye old acting skills I honed during the career that I aged out of to affect neutral facial expressions for my rapt audience. So whenever Ezra asks me, do you think it's good, Mom? The world will let you know, is my answer. <laughs> and that is really the best of all possible answers, because the only sure sign that something won't become the next big thing is if your mother likes it. <laughs> but in thinking about this, what's going on with kids today? I called Katherine Bowers, whose daughter is about the same age as Ezra. And Catherine co-authored Wildhood, a book that looks at coming of age in a variety of species. And I asked if she felt our offspring deserved being labeled special snowflakes, that derogatory term often invoked by older boomers that implies feeling entitled to special treatment. And Bowers explained to me that every adolescent, whether hummingbird or high schooler, has a unique experience of this volatile and vulnerable phase of life. A universal feature of this intense uh, moment of adolescence and social pressure is an obsession with where they fit into the group. For birds, mammals, and even crustaceans, social hierarchies are formed during adolescence. And the labels they pick up during this sort of sorting time follow them for the rest of their lives. For hyenas, for example, adolescence is when a cackle, that is the fabulously evocative nomenclature for a group of hyenas. Can you beat that? A cackle of hyenas? I love that. That's when they battle for social rank, which determines who gets the best food and most desirable mates. High-ranking hyenas even get more sleep because they don't have to work the night shift. <laughs> Scientists call this sorting of hierarchy status status. And once status is fixed, the lower status hyena, although not as privileged as the alpha, can find happiness as an essential member of the cackle. But our childs, our kids' childhoods have been disrupted in ways that make them seem less formed. And one of those most profound disruptions is social media. Our kids don't get a break from the assessing and the comparing to others. They're constantly jangled up and down. It's physically and emotionally draining and debilitating. Bowers considers, considers the digital age as much of a disruption as the coming of age in the Industrial Revolution. The stakes are so much higher for kids in every arena growing up I'd managed to waste a lot of time wondering if the professor and Marianne would ever make it off Gilligan's Island. <laughs> but our kids are waiting for climate change to turn Tulsa into beachfront property. This eco-anxiety, as it's being called, is just another in the laundry list of distractions, internet, adult attention spans, school shootings, the daunting prospect of earning a living in the gig economy at a time when class mobility is the lowest it's been in 100 years. No wonder that along with being labeled snowflakes, Gen Z has also been called generation anxiety. And as parents, we don't want our kids to fall through the cracks, hence the tendency to overcompensate. So I know that's a laugh riot. <laughs> Although imagine crustaceans sorting. That's just crazy to me that they actually do that but they do. But I, I wanted to read that because I think, particularly in light of recent events in the country, we have to appreciate what a difficult time they're going through. And so that one chapter is really a special chapter for anyone who has young people in their lives. So that is a little taste of this book. Thank you for listening to the reading. And I do want to mention, you know, I did get a new couch. I did. I didn't get any of those, though. I got something else that I felt was more appropriate for me, and I have named it after Mary Tyler Moore's sidekick, the Rhoda. 
that's the one for me. Uh, but I would love to take questions now and have my favorite part of any live event is getting to hear from you. So, Debbie has a microphone. We can come around. Oh, we've got, we've got several microphones. We can take questions from any side. Goodness. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the story of bringing in the young people to your home? And I think you're doing something else with that oh, in development yes. that maybe yes. you could talk about. Well, so I decided when I decided that the way to save my home would be to start renting out a room and becoming a landlady, I put out the word to friends that I had a room available. Did anyone know anyone? And people started sending me things, and I had no idea what would happen, but I had someone lined up. They fell through, and I was sitting in my car listening to NPR. Don't ever listen to NPR. <laughs> things will happen in your life. And I heard the Rapkins a couple in Beverly Hills talking about being paired with young people who were unhoused. Now, I thought that meant foreign exchange students, <laughs> but that's not what that meant. That meant young people experiencing homelessness. And I heard that you got a stipend for inviting them into your home uh, for a certain amount of time. And it was a program that I explained to my sister who said, what kind of people do this? And I said, Lisa, Marty and Arlene Rapkin. <laughs> I, we, we could have had a Seder at their house. I'm they seem like very nice people. Nice people do this. But uh, I, I have to say, I had no idea what I was getting into. And when I met the two young people who had been living in their car who were covered with facial tattoos, I said, anyone but them. <laughs> but they were the couple that needed a place first. And then I said, okay, and I jumped in. And in this story, um, which was awarded a prize by the LA Press, the Los Angeles Press Club, one that first came out in, in the Los Angeles Times, which was really a thrill because, you know, I'm an actress who appeared in a hot tub once with Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> So to win a journalism award is so satisfying, you know. Uh, but, you know, I, I jumped in, and I really jumped into this whole program because a stipend went along with it. It was, it was about renting this out. I, I was not looking to save anyone, um, but I was open to the experience. I did say yes to it, and I said yes to these young people, and... For the first few nights that they moved in, as you'll read, I, I didn't sleep. I was sure they were going to murder me in my sleep. And they didn't sleep, I later learned, because they were sure I was going to murder them. <laughs> what kind of person takes in people experiencing homelessness? What is, they thought maybe I was in some kind of religious cult. And it changed all of our lives. And it, it, it was such a, a humbling experience for me to learn how much I was otherizing them, and for them, how much they had otherized me. We all grew so much, and, you know, I, I'm happy to say that that kind of program called the Host Home Program, when I did it, there, it was operating in 11 cities around the country. It's now in over 40 cities around the country <laughs> because people have an extra bedroom. It's a way of dealing with a housing issue that doesn't require infrastructure building. And it just requires opening your heart just a little bit more if you have an extra bedroom. And it was such a rewarding experience. And it's also a really successful program because uh, while the young people are living with you, they're getting services, and they have something like a 98 percentile of the young people who participate in this program go on to permanent housing. In fact, Kiana, Kiana Nicole, if you look for her on Instagram, has a record deal, the rapper who is staying with me, and she's now making more money than me. <laughs> and um, she, they're just the dearest, she's just so dear to me. And as I like to say, you know, I'm not her mother, she has a mother, but I am a mother. 
And it was another way that I found usefulness and purpose and unexpected adaptability in my emptiness. So I, I look forward to your reading that story. I have been working on adapting that for HBO. You know, if anyone has a in with the gods of network television and the decisions they make, I'm ready to make sacrifices. <laughs> Tell me what to give. A pinky? Sure. Whatever it takes. No, it's, so it's been really fun developing it too. And right now I'm working with an actress I love, Lisa Edelstein. Uh, she makes a good me. She's, she's, she's a terrific actress. So we shall see the next steps on that one. Yes. Jason Stewart here. Hi. Jason Stewart, one of I, my favorite actors. I adore you. Um, I am uh, really interested because as, a, as an older people person, I'm throwing up in my as mouth an right old, now. I am an old now. Yes, as an older person now, uh, the idea of uh, all these trans and all these different types of kids that are non-binary. I have a couple friends that also have kids that are. Uh, how did you deal with Ezra? And, and I see you're comfortable with the they and how you say it. I'm just a regular gay guy. And now uh, there are all different kinds of people. And it's, it's uh, I just, how as a mom did you deal with it? And the fear and the, uh, the, the learning abilities and all that kind of stuff. Oh, Jason, I'm so glad you asked that. And that was one of the reasons why, you know, it's important for me. You know, when I moved to New York to study acting and to become an actress, I moved to the West Village and I lived in the gay community. And these were, this was my community, you know, and so... When Ezra started talking about identifying as a non-binary person, I wasn't, I, I was, I was not prepared for that. That just wasn't in my frame. And but then I was also, I had this combo. But, but I'm someone who's, who, who is, grew, I grew, I feel, I grew up in that community. So what, who am I? And one of the things I write about in the book and in this story, I think you'll appreciate this, is that. In my mind, my first thought was, I was saying, oh, it's a phase. And then I thought, oh my God, am I gonna, it's a phase them? How can I do that? I, that's, that's a phrase we know and that, we, that, that carries a lot of baggage or they'll grow out of it. And then I thought, okay, you know what? I am just going to have to wholeheartedly throw my uh, heart and person into this and just say, I don't, totally understand it, although I do write about this, and we know there is historical pres precedence for this, back to the ancient world. So, you know, there's sort of nothing new under the sun, but things, things wane and wax in popularity. Um, and even more than that, I felt like, you know, I just, here's what I don't want to be. I don't want to be in that generation who heard Jimi Hendrix play the national anthem and said, that's not music, because we know how that worked out. You know, I, 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 I felt like, you know, this, the world will belong to them, and I think surely things will settle as, as I think whenever there's a, a, a new, um, you know, trend, uh, or something becomes suddenly uh, not taboo anymore that was always there. Uh, it takes a little bit to, to attenuate ourselves and, and to work out how we do this all. But I think it's, it's institutional now, you know. Uh, and I think that uh, I decided one of the most important things I could do was accept and step away. I have drawn the line at one thing. One thing I, it's just very hard for me to accept is... My child, Ezra, and their partner wear matching prairie dresses. Really, the prairie dress. <laughs> My honey, anything, anything, but the, do we have to have the prairie dress? Non-binary, trans, honey, I love you, whatever, but the prairie dress. So I, have t I do take a little issue with that. But Jamie, yes. <laughs> well... <laughs> Well, you know, this is a chapter in the book. Uh, and it's just such a funny thing. Uh, I, I decided to dip my toe in, and this is one of the, I'm blushing, you may not 
you, you know, you want to, might want to read this in a place where people can't see. I, just, this is one of the chapters in the book about the things I felt I needed to do to get back into the dating world. And one of the indignities that I do feel comfortable speaking out loud about is that my sister, who runs my life, because she's my older sister, and still, no matter how old we are, she's going to run my life. She decided she didn't think I was going to try hard enough. And she signed me up for something called lingerie box, which is like birch box, like the cosmetics that arrive every month. But no, panties and bras. She's like, you, you just, you don't pay enough attention to lingerie. She, she signed, so panties and bras started appearing on my doorstep. And... They ask you on a survey of, you know, when you, when, when you get signed up of what kind of style you would like. And they had like flirty or sexy. And I tried to fill in, it said other. I put spinstery. <laughs> but the algorithm didn't accept that. I put Miss Havisham. <laughs> the algorithm didn't accept that either. So, you know, it was... There's a lot, of, a lot of ups and downs to get there, and you can read about that journey in the uh, chapter that is titled after what, you know, there are, there are these doomsday preppers. I became like a doomsday prepper for lubes. So that chapter is called Lubepocalypse Now. <laughs> You'll have to read that one in private. That's boudoir reading. Do you have any other questions for me? Before I sign books for you, Anyone Annabelle, else? can you yes, tell maybe. us where you're going tomorrow and what could be the subject matter of your next book? You may be the last people to see me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think as one of the products, one of the motivators for what I'm about to tell you is this pandemic has been so hard. You know, so much has been taken from us. I've decided to throw myself into life with abandon. So while it is maybe everyone's dream at age 20 to get in a van and tour with a band, <laughs> I'm doing it at 60. <laughs> tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow, I am flying to London. I can't even this out loud. To get in a van with the guy I'm seeing as the manager, his, one of his bands, a heavy metal band. <laughs> They're in their 20s. And tour festivals in Europe and work as their merch girl, or as I prefer, merch crone. <laughs> so this is definitely the last time I'm gonna be seeing air conditioning. If you have snacks for me, give them, I'll smuggle them in. So, yeah, I, you know, I just, when I, when I was asked if I wanted to possibly go on this trip, I said, my God, nothing sounds worse than that. I'll do it. <laughs> That'll be a story if I live. Please so. help me in thanking Annabelle Gurich. <laughs> And Annabelle will be signing her books for you. So if you'd like to line up right here, she'll be right downstage and sign your books. Thank I you, ladies will. and gentlemen. Thank you so much.